everyone, welcome to The Homegrown Artist. My name is Barbara and today we're gonna be reviewing fully and completely and very thoroughly the Turner's Concentrated Artist Professional Watercolors. Now that is a long name, so I am gonna shorten that to just Turner's or Turner Watercolors throughout the rest of the video. Um, and also in this video, I'm announcing the giveaway. I haven't picked it or anything yet. I have a bunch of names in this bag on little folded pieces of paper that I'm gonna blindly reach in and grab one at the end of the video. So stay tuned for that. And if you're not interested in Turner's, you can of course skip to the end and just see the giveaway. Um, but some information about Turner's watercolors. So um, these watercolors are made by Turner's Col Color Works in Japan. So they are Japanese made watercolor, although they don't really act or feel like Japanese watercolors. They feel more like um, Eastern European watercolors or American watercolors more so than Japanese. Usually in Asian watercolors they have a lot of different um, binding agents that they put in in their watercolors and these are not the case. First of all I, want, I do want to say that I did receive um, the Turner's watercolors from Jerry's Artorama for free. Um, however I'm not being paid by them in any way to review this video and all of my review information is going to be my true beliefs and true thoughts about these paints not influenced any in any way or biased in any way by the fact that they gave them to me for free. This is going to be a true and honest review. So a few things about Turner's watercolors. One of them is that it is po they're possibly named after J.M.W. Turner who is a famous British uh, watercolorist. Um, now that is not a for sure thing. I have not found that written on the uh, Turner Color Works website or Jerry's Artorama or Jackson's where they offer them as well. But if they are named after him, that was brilliant because he was an extremely amazing artist. If you haven't heard of him, go check him out. He started off sketching in watercolor and then started doing loose paintings as well, more atmospheric paintings, landscapes and stuff like that. And then he got, really got into architecture and a lot of his architectural paintings, the way that he shows light is just amazing. He is just a great watercolor so I think I'm gonna get a book about him and maybe study the way that he painted and stuff like that. Um, so yeah these were possibly named after him not for sure. So Turner um, watercolors offer 148 different colors with 65 of them being sing single pigment and the good thing about those 65 is that they're the ones that you want to be single pigment um, or from what I've noticed so far. Um, and then they also have very light, fast colors. Um, their claim is, uh, based on their scale, which is a one star to three stars, that their one star is equivalent to fair, um, which would be a three in the ASTM rating. Their two star would be equivalent to a two in an ASTM rating, and their one star would be equivalent to a one in an ASTM rating. Um, within their 148 pigments, they have only 10 that are two star, three that are one star, and then opera is the only one that has no rating. So according to them, all almost all of their colors are fair to light fast other than um, opera. So there's no bad light fast ratings really. I About a three is about as low as I will go and actually sell that painting. But usually I aim for two or three on the AST, or not two or three. <laughs> one or two on the ASTM scale. Three is kind of going a little bit too um, fugitive for me. Um, but they are claiming that most of their colors are extremely light fast with an excellent rating. So there's only, if I add them up, um, 14 colors out of their entire range that are not either um, good or excellent. Uh, some claims that Turner's makes about their watercolors is that they are made using only the finest of pigments and high-end gum arabic with no fillers whatsoever. So their next claim is that they are so packed with color, I'm thinking they mean pigment by that, um, that they have almost double as much as some other brands. Now this, I don't know if it's actually true, but I feel like with some of the colors it can be. Um, and I'll show you that when I go through the swatches that I did um, because I did these a little bit differently than I did other swatches and what I did is I tried to instead of loading my brush with as much color as possible for this part right here 
I just, I kept my brush wet and I just kind of did it a few times to try to get the mass tone of the color because I noticed when I did it here, I was getting so much color that it kind of made pigments that are transparent like this thalo blue look a little bit opaque. Um, but it's not, um, and you can see that in the swatches that I will go over with later. So I'm guessing that just means that they are um, covered with more, or filled with more pigments. And the fact that there's no fillers just kind of helps that along. All right, so they also claim that they're beautifully transparent. I find that um, pretty much true, although they do have opaque colors, so not all of their colors are transparent. And then highest light fast ratings. Um, so those two statements kind of can't be tested by me, I guess. I could do a light fast rating test for them, but it would take a few months, and I haven't done that. Um, but the colors are transparent, the ones that are supposed to be. And then they do have good light fast ratings, especially in the sets that, I show, that I'm going to show you. So the next question, as an artist myself, I would ask when someone's doing a overview is where can I find these colors and how expensive are they? Um, so like I said, Jackson's did send, or I meant not Jackson, Jerry's Artorama did send me these colors for free. Um, but you can check out their website. They do offer the 15 milliliter tubes open stock. Um, and the price only varies from $8 for the least exp expensive pigment series A um, to $13 and some change for the most expensive pigments, which is series F. Also, Jerry's always has a sale going on. And right now, at this current moment, Jerry's has a sale on Turner's watercolors. And I found, uh, like say, ultramarine blue or thalo blue for like $4 and some change. So that's a really good deal for those colors, especially, especially seeing that those colors, um, usually in any brand, tend to act quite well. Um, the quinacridones and the thalos. Maybe not the ultramarine, but I have noticed that the ultramarine in here is really relatively good. Um, so another way that you can get them is a little dot card for a dollar and something. They don't include all their colors. I think it's like six colors on the dot card, but it's only a dollar and some change. You can also get them in sets. One of the biggest sets that they offer, um, and I don't know how much money you save in this set, but it comes... Um, with a Fabriano 9x12 block in Rhapsody Kalinske Sable brush set, a Creative Mark mesh bag, and the 18 set of 15 milliliter tubes. And that's priced at $236.39. Um, so that's their biggest set, but I mean, you get a lot of stuff that comes with it. They also offer sets of um, 12, 18, and 24 of the 15 milliliter, milliliter tube. And then you can also get a set of 18 5 milliliter tubes, which, um, to be honest, for beginners starting off, I would suggest that. Um, or for intermediate artists, I would say, um, if you're trying out this watercolor and you don't want to invest in many tubes or a sale's not going on at that time or um, you just don't have the money for it, then try out the 18 set of 5 milliliter tubes because uh, in their sets, they actually put relevant colors in there, unlike a lot of other brand sets. And um, I actually really enjoy this 24 set, which um, we're gonna cover in just a minute. Um, but the set of 18 five milliliter tubes is only around 20 something dollars. I think I think it's 36.69 and then it goes on sale sometimes. I know on Amazon it's 20 something dollars, like 24, 25. Um, but anyway, you can also get them in sets of four. Um, so they have the spring set, the pearl set, the sunset or jewel tone set, which is this one right here, as well as the fine metal set. Uh, and the price range for those is uh, around $25 to $48, depending on which set you get. So of course, the pearl set and the fine metal set is gonna be more expensive than say the spring set, which has um, colors that tend to have white in it, like pale wisteria or fresh water, which are colors that are included in the spring set. This right here is the Sunset Jewel Tone set. And one of my biggest complaints about this watercolor is the fact that they offer four, four tube sets. Why in the world do they have three tube boxes? Ah. 
I don't know if that's a Jerry's thing or if that's like a Turner's thing. I mean, the Turner's box, it's a Turner's, uh, Turner Color Works made box, but I don't know if it's just Jerry that offers the sets. Um, but that's kind of a pet peeve for me because what if I wanted to store them in their sets? Like I, of course, will probably keep these in this box until I need them and maybe put these in a Ziploc baggie to store them on the side. What if I only ordered the set and wanted to keep all four colors together in the set and store them? I can't do that because the fourth one doesn't fit in this box and that drives me, the OCD part of me, a little bit crazy. I mean, how hard is it to make a cardboard box that can carry the extra fourth tube? So that's just one of my little pet peeves about, I guess, how I receive the paint. But other than that, the packaging is perfectly fine. They are made with a um, cardboard box. And my view on that is the cheaper the packaging, probably, especially in artist watercolors, I would rather them spend more money on the paint and the pigments than the packaging. Um, and a lot of watercolors do come in cardboard boxes and this one is just perfectly fine. It's not as fancy as say Magello Mission Gold's box. There's no gold foil or anything. But I figure they put the, the money into the pigments. And that's, that was my hope when I saw the cardboard box uh, as the container. Uh, and you can lift this little thing up outside of the lid and then each tube has its own little slot. And now, I cannot remember if I said this or not, but they do offer uh, sets of 12, 18, and 24 in the 15 milliliter sets. And uh, the color range that they offer in here is amazing. I will say that. When I first did the swatches, um, actually I'll show you the swatch from my color chart that I did for my palette. I haven't laminated yet, so it's stuck under this little thing right here. <coughs> Excuse me. But a lot of the colors that they give you in the 24 color set are, are amazing for a beginner. They give you um, three, actually four if you want to count yellow ochre um, as a yellow, but I count that as a neutral. But they give you three yellows, a more greenish lemony cool yellow, a mid yellow, and then a warm yellow. They give you um, four reds, so you have an orangish red, a mid kind of mid-tone red, a pinky red, and a purpley red. And then you get the um, PV23, which is just a great mixing color, and they did not add, this came separately, in the 24 set, they did not add any other purples. They only added the PV23, which I think is a good color for every beginner to have because it is wonderful in mixing. Um, it makes, I think I did a pigment, uh, pigment highlight video on PV23. I will link that in the description bar down below as well as in an i-card up above if y'all want to go check that out um, but it's a very very good mixing color so I'm glad they added that um, and then when it comes to the blues they added tons of blues um, so you can get a lot of different mixtures with the blues that they offered here or all the blues that they offer there's five of them one of them is a turquoise which is this one right here so it's more of a it's a cobalt blue they call it turquoise blue um, so whenever I first saw it, I was like, okay, so that's probably going to be um, phthalo green and phthalo blue mixed together. I was very surprised when I found out that it was PB28 and it was a cobalt pigment. Um, so it's basically a cobalt teal or cobalt teal blue, kind of like right here. Um, but then their cobalt turquoise, uh, which is not included, I ordered that because I was thinking I wanted a cobalt teal. I thought that would be it, but it's completely different. Um, and then they also include a Maya Blue in the set, uh, which is pretty cool just to have that textured type blue. And you also get your normal colors like Ultramarine, Phthalo Blue, Cerulean Blue, um, which is awesome. And then they add PG7, which is again a color I think everyone should have on their palette for mixing purposes, not just to use straight from the tube, but it is a fantastic, fantastic color for mixing. Um, now here's three colors that I could have done without, but it's not a bad thing that they added it in there because um, these two colors right here um, are made with PG36, which is not included in the set, and PY10, which is also not included in the set, although PY109 is very similar. Um, I would have preferred to have a PG36 
and a PY110 separately. <laughs> but still, um, a lot of people, especially floral painters, like to have um, some greens in, in their sets. And so it may be a good thing that they added those greens. And of course, even though these are made from separate or from the same pigments, they are two different, very different colors. This one possibly has more of the um, PY110 in it, the yellow in it. And then the olive green I could, of course, have done without as well. Um, I could have mixed that my own. I have PG7. Uh, PY110 is very similar to, um, well, actually, it depends on how it's made chemically and physically, but it's similar to one of these yellows. Um, and then PR101, uh, which I have down here. <clears throat> and that PR101, that red, is just to kick back the saturation of the green to make it more olivey or earth tony. Um, and then they offer some great neutrals. They offer a navels yellow, um, which is good for those who enjoy color swatching, or not color swatching, what am I thinking of? Those who enjoy painting portraits and stuff like that. Um, I think it's a pretty good navels yellow. Um, and then they include yellow ochre with PY43, which I think is great. Um, this I got on my own, this I got on my own, but they do include Venetian red, burnt sienna, burnt umber, um, which are, this, this, and this, which are really good earth colors to have in your set. Um, and I like the fact that their burnt sienna and burnt umber are made by single pigments, unlike a lot of um, Asian type uh, watercolors. Are Eastern, Western Europe? I have no idea. Anyway, um, a lot of Japanese watercolors or um, Asian watercolors tend to have mixed pigments in here, like the Korean Mission Gold Burnt Sienna is a multitude of pigments. Um, and this one, these two right here are just single pigments, which I love. Um, and then another thing I like is that they included, or a thing that I don't like is that they included black and white. However, I am becoming a little bit more comfortable with using white and mixing it in colors. I think I posted something on YouTube about that, um, mixing all of these colors uh, in my palette with the white, and I'll show you that. It's on the back of this. Um, I don't understand why they use PW6 and PW7, because white can be a single pigment, but I'm thinking they did it so it wouldn't be super opaque, but it would still have a little bit of opacity, because um, this color right here is uh, semi-opaque. So, not that great for gouache, because when you try to use um, enough white to make it as opaque as you would want it to be for gouache, you pretty much just end up with a tint. Um, and then the ivory black is actually not an ivory black, but two um, pigments mixed together, uh, which is fantastic for those of you who are vegan and would rather not use ivory black, uh, which is normally made from the ivory of elephants. So I do like the fact that they did that. They mixed two pigments to get it to look like ivory black, but not actually adding the ivory black pigment. So this 24 set is actually a really good set to have to start out with. You get the basic colors you need for mixing, plus a few that are already pre-mixed, but not too many that are pre-mixed. So there's not a lot of oranges. This is actually a red, not an orange. So there's not a lot of oranges, not a lot of pre-mixed purples um, or multi multiple pigment purples, which is fantastic. Another thing I like about the 20, oh, let me show you the white that I did in case you didn't see my uh, post on Instagram. But here are all the colors mixed with white, and this is the uh, quinacridone magenta mixed with white. It is so cool, it's like a hot pink. And then this one is um, the phthalo green, which I knew would make like a teal color based on like mixing the colors with um, in acrylics, but it's just a beautiful color. And even the burnt sienna with the white turned out to be a pretty color. Um, a lot of them turned out to be very pretty. This is phthalo blue, I think. No, this is the cobalt. Let's see, let's flip it over. Yeah, this is the turquoise mixed with the white. And then this is phthalo blue mixed with the white. So I'm actually learning to like mixing whites with Japanese, especially with um, Japanese watercolors. Um, I've tried it with Shin Shinhan, however you say that, as well as uh, Mission Gold. And because their whites are so transparent, it doesn't change the opacity too much of the other paints. It just makes them Semi, either semi-transparent if they're transparent or semi-opaque if they're already semi-transparent and so on. So like this color right here um, is, let's flip it over and see, 
Mars violet, and it already is extremely opaque. It has an opacity rating of C, which is the ex really opaque. Um, so whenever you mix that with white, it definitely is opaque. I unfortunately didn't do the, uh, I can't think of words right now. What's it called? Oh my God. Permanent marker line across here because this is 90 pound paper and I didn't want it to show through. It normally does show through. And I wanted to have it to where I could flip and see uh, what the colors look like when white is mixed in. So anyway, that was a fun little experiment that I did. And it turned out some of the colors are actually pretty nice. Like this, I actually really like this color. And uh, the purple with the white is really pretty. And then I even tried to mix, I know um, Daniel Smith's Lavender is made with ultramarine, some kind of granulating purple, I can't remember which one, and a white. So what I did is... Uh, mixed ultramarine with purple Gromwell um, with uh, white and I got this right here and it turned out really really nicely and almost matches lavender Daniel Smith's lavender really well and then this one's very similar to wisteria uh, so yeah anyway I know a lot of artists don't like using white and I just wanted to see what was the big deal about them always adding white and black to sets because that it used to bother me that because I never used white and black and I still probably would not use black um, but the white can come in handy in some circumstance circumstances um, if you need to do an under layer but you want the under layer to be opaque so <clears throat> it'll shine through a little bit more then you can mix it with a little bit of white and have that there so anyway that's enough about the white but the sets come like I said with great colors in there Another good thing about this set is 17 of them are single pigment colors. The only ones that are multiple pigment colors are the green mixtures um, and then gamboge, which is right here, permanent gram gamboge. Um, and that one is a multi-pigmented color, which in most companies it tends to be two or three pigments um, because I think the the actual gamboge pigment um, doesn't exist anymore. Oh, they stopped mining for it or something like that. But a lot of the gamboge colors have gone to um, multiple pigments. Um, and then, like I said, the greens. And then, yeah, I think that's pretty much it uh, for the multi-pigment colors. Uh, oh, the black and white are multi-pigment colors, like I said earlier, but I think they did that on purpose to make this more transparent and make this one um, not ivory black but seem like it with the hue. So that's a fantastic thing. Another good thing about the 24 set are most of the colors are light fast with the exception of permanent scarlet which is right here. Um, but this is made with pure 188 which is the naphthol pigment and um, that of course is already uh, it has an ASTM rating of two, so that makes sense for that to be um, have a two star instead of a one star and their light fast rating scale. Um, and then the other color that has a light fast rating less than a one star is the dioxazine violet, which has two stars, um, or less than a three star. Three star is highest light fastness rating for their scale. One star is the least light fast. So both of these have two, which is kind of in between. Um, but like I said, this one is normal for that PR 188 pigment. And then dioxazine violet, it has a uh, variable light fastness between brands and um, they still haven't decided how light fast it really is. I know the ASTM gives the pigment itself either a two to a three light fast rating, um, but a lot, in between a lot of different companies, um, based on their formula, their formula can change the light fast ratings of the pigment itself. So um, it make, it also makes sense that this has a light fast rating of two. So everything has a light, everything in this box has a light fast rating of three stars or an equivalency to either a one or two on the ASTM scale. So that's pretty amazing as well. Unless you do your own test, you really can't absolutely be sure of light fast ratings um, because usually a lot of companies um, base it off of the pigments that they're using and not their specific formula. But with these, I like the fact that they say they have absolutely no fillers um, because that means that if they're basing it off the pigments themselves, then it's probably more accurate than um, 
other brands who use different binders or different um, different fillers and stuff like that. So when I first got the tubes, there are a few things that I did um, to try them out. So the first thing I did is actually squeeze them out on student quality paper. And this has been in my trash, actually. I should have uh, saved it to use the extra paint. But um, in some of these little squirts uh, or dollops of paint, um, dots of paint, uh, what happened was when I first squeezed the tube out, the gum arabic was sitting up on the top. So that means that sometimes the gum arabic separates from the paint. Now that is not only for this brand of paint. I have seen that happen in every single brand of paint that I have. And the only thing you can do to fix it really is um, sometimes what I'll do if, this, if the tube is semi-empty is I'll kind of squeeze it back and forth to try to mix the paint up. But before you... Um, before you squeeze the tube, you want to make sure that you kind of tap it down a bit and kind of get it from the top because if you open it after mixing it up like that, it will kind of like squeeze out really fast. So you want to make sure you squeeze the tube a little bit to get the paint to go back down. Um, that happened here. <laughs> um, another thing that I noticed, oh, so back to that actually. So you can see here with my first little squeeze it, of the paint that a lot of them, and if you can't see them, I will zoom in, um, but a lot of them, you can still see the gum arabic just dried around the pigment. So the gum arabic did separate from the pigment in a lot of these paints. Another thing you can do if you have already squeezed them out in your palette, if there's too much gum arabic, like there was in this one right here, um, you can take a brush and pick some of it up, and then just take a toothpick and mix the paints together. I didn't have a problem with all of the paints with that happening, but just with, um, I would say probably about five. I know Maya Blue did it, the Cobalt did it, which Cobalt almost always does it. Um, this is their, our turquoise blue is the, their color. Um, and then it happened with the olive green, this yellow, I can't remember which one it is, <laughs> sorry. And then the turmeric, uh, it did it on there as well. Another thing I noticed, and you're probably noticing here, is that uh, student paper is probably not the way to go with these paints. They are heavily pigmented and because of that what happens is student grade paper is machine made so they usually have a texture and this is Arteza paper and it definitely has like a linear texture that you can see. So these paints look awful on the student grade paper and it's not just uh, the paints, it's more the student grade paper because the paints work perfectly fine on artist grade paper. Um, but you can see all the texture and all the brush strokes and that's just something that I'm not a fan of. So I would suggest getting the best quality paper you can to use these paints on because of any paint will work better on an artist quality paper. Um, so the next thing that I noticed about the tubes comes whenever I open turmeric. So I have squeezed the same amount of paint from each of these tubes except for the permanent scarlet which burst all over that student grade piece of paper I had there. But in, in only this tube so far, I've came across what I think is an air bubble. And I've read other, that other people have said that too, that some of the tubes that happens in, and that is a quality control issue for, um, for Turner Colorworks, not really for Jerry's Artorama. Um, but basically it's just a problem with how they fill the tubes. So you get air bubbles in it. So when you're going to squeeze, it kind of pops. And uh, that happened, this is that color right here. So if you can tell, I actually, because of that air bubble, I'm actually down a whole lot more paint. If you look at this tube compared to this one, it's like I lost two milliliters of tubes. I'm at uh, two milliliters of paint from that air bubble. So that's something that I'm not too happy about. I, I've never come across that in any other paint, uh, just having air bubbles. And again, that's just a quality control issue with the tubes not having anything to do with the paint. Um, so yeah, I would just also consider that before purchasing. And if something like that does happen to you, um, I would send it back. I'm not going to send mine back. I did receive it for free. But if you bought, spent your own hard-earned money, on these paints and you got a couple of tubes that had air bubbles in them like that. I tested all the other ones. There's no air bubbles in any of the other ones that I have. Um, I think this one may have had a slight air bubble as well. 
And I think I just got it out when I squeezed it and everything. But I did test most of the tubes. I did actually test this one, so we'll never know. Um, because then an air bubble did happen when I squeezed the whole tube. Uh, but yeah, that's something to look out for. And if I were you, I would definitely send them back because that is something, I mean, you're paying for 15 milliliters of tube and you, ex I keep saying 15 milliliters of tube. You are paying for 15 milliliters of paint. And I think if, if you're paying for it, you should get that amount because two milliliters of paint is actually quite a lot. Um, that's, that's a half pan basically of paint that was not filled in this tube. So that's something that I do have a big complaint about. Um, and again, like I said, that's not a Jerry's thing. That is a Turner Color Works um, quality control type thing. All right, so now we're gonna get into the fun stuff. We're gonna start looking at the swatches that I made and comparing them to artist pigments and everything. But first I'm just gonna show you my little palette. I'm pretty sure I already showed you it. Um, but one of the things I was questioning whenever I started filling the palette in the video, uh, in the last video I posted, is whether or not some of the paints would crack. And I did think that it was a possibility that especially turmeric, which is right here, was going to crack. And of course it did. This is one that the gum arabic uh, kind of separated it out from it, and it was very liquidy. And so you can see the cracks in there. Uh, a few other paints cracked as well, but not that many. I think I only had three. Let's see. One, two... Three. This color right here, the cobalts tend to crack. Um, the PG50 ones, if they don't have, if they're not mixed with honey, they tend to crack anyway. Um, and then Mars Violet, I've actually never had until this one right here, but it's a beautiful color and it did crack as well. And then there's some that, and this is based on the pigment, not on their formulation, but some pigments. Um, tend to crack more than other pigments. And this one has um, PY42, which is another pigment that tends to crack. Um, the earth tones generally tend to crack. Um, and so that may be why this one cracked. And then some of the more opaque colors, more thick colors, uh, like the wine red and the purple Gromwell, the Venetian red, this is also Venetian red mixed with this color right here. Beautiful color though. Um, it like bubbled up like this as well, but as you can see, I've used a ton of it uh, because it's very beautiful. Um, but yeah, just colors that are, are like that, of course, they didn't settle down into the palette, which is, I actually really like it when they settle down into the palette. The thing that you can do whenever you are setting up your palette, which I normally do this, but I wanted, when I'm testing out paints, I wanna see how they act naturally. I don't wanna change them um, in any way before I test them. So when I refill the palette, what I will do is when I'm, say, pouring colors like this, that crack and stuff, I may add a little bit of glycerin or honey, or I may just take a toothpick and stir it up and flatten it out to make it like this. Um, that way it won't dry with cracks. So that's something to think about. Um, it's personal preference. It really doesn't bother me. I can still paint and grab paint from this. Uh, it's no big deal. Uh, but it's more like appealing when the colors are flat in, in the palette, if that makes sense at all. Um, but anyway, yeah, I was just going to kind of show you how that worked out. All right, so I'm going to move that aside. Try not to move my light again. And then we're going to get two color swatches. Hopefully I can have this whole thing on camera. Give me a second to act like an old lady and stand up. <laughs> Ow. I don't know if I've mentioned what they found out was wrong with me, but I have slip, slipping rib syndrome and a lot of my ribs are moving around a lot and causing lots of pain. I'll, it's intermittent. Sometimes it feels like I'm having a heart attack. Sometimes it feels like my liver is exploding. Sometimes it feels like my spleen is exploding. And then on one of the x-rays, it looks like I have a fracture on one of my ribs as well. And they're chalking it down to the fact that I fall a lot from seizures. So I've been trying to stay stress-free and not have seizures because seizures plus rib problems equals ow. Anyway, just explaining that because it, I sounded like an old lady trying to stand up to make sure that I am in frame for these colors. Oh, I also want to mention that Jerry's also sent me some of the Mimic Kalinske brushes. They're amazing. 
but I didn't want to review them in this video alone because I'm not actually going to paint anything in this video. This is just going to be more of the scientific -y stuff behind these colors. Um, I will, however, do another video where I'm painting with the Turner's watercolors um, and reviewing the brushes while I do that. It's kind of complicated to review a brush and a, a complete set of watercolors at the same time. So, And this video is going to be long enough without a painting, so there will be a second part where I'm painting with the Turner's as well as reviewing the brushes. So what I did here is whenever I squeezed the two tubes out here and made little dots and then flowed the colors, I put the dots directly by the little opacity areas. So whenever I pulled the paint out, I pulled out a lot of pigment, a lot of paint. And so on colors that say they're transparent, it actually looks pretty opaque. So I realized um, that possibly their claim that they have double the amount of pigment may be true. So what I did with these swatch cards, I did it a little bit differently than I do my other swatch cards. With my other swatch cards, I will take a flat brush that I don't have on hand right now, but I'll take a brush, load it with the most pigment that I can get on there and uh, fill this in and pull it down over the color and then pull that color out. For the Turner's watercolors, because they say they, because of their claim that they had the double amount of pigment in there, I figured what I would do, since I did see that using a lot of paint causes more opacity um, in colors that normally wouldn't be opaque, I figured I would decrease the amount of paint to water ratio. So I let them dry in the palette, and then whenever I went to get the paint, I would pick it up like this, only a few swipes. I, of course, sprayed the paint first with water um, just to get them activated. They do act like that. They don't have honey or anything in that. They're more, the texture is more similar to Daniel Smith's texture, I would say, um, where they kind of dry harder and you have to spray them to get them activated, um, which I do that anyway. Um, but that's what I did, and then I just picked up a little bit of paint. Like, I didn't scrub to get a bunch of paint. I just went and picked up a few things of paint. And that's how I did the swatches here. And I still pulled them down over the transparency area and did the glazes like I normally do as well. Um, so the first color that we have is um, Permanent Lemon. And these are not in order of how, how I would send them or how they were in the box. This is in order of how they are in my palette um, because that is also how I organize them in my swatch book. Um, so this is Permanent Lemon, and as you can see, um, it still has that intensity as all these other colors. Um, it's not exactly the most lemony lemon color that I've ever seen, but um, for instance, Daniel Smith's Lemon Yellow is it's more of a mid-tone yellow. It's not a cool yellow like the Hansy yellows or anything like that. But just uh, your basic mid-tone yellow, which is what I think this should be considered. But they also give you another mid-tone yellow. So this one um, in its tint is cooler than the other two yellows. But it's made with PY109, which I haven't heard of before, so I decided to look it up. And it's actually the um, organic version, PY109, is the organic version of isoindolene yellow where PY110, which I do have, I think, or I have it mixed with something. Um, this one has PY97 and PY110, um, but that is the next pigment up in the yellow pigments, and it's still isoindolene yellow, it's just synthetic. Uh, so this one is actually the more organic uh, natural pigment. It's not created in a lab, which I think is pretty cool. and that occurs in a lot of Turner's paints. You see more traditional pigments that they used to use rather than um, the newer pigments uh, like PY110. Um, so this is the actual pigment, not the syn synthetic one. Um, and these type of colors, depending on the physical and chemical properties when they're making the paints, um, they can range from being a super lemony yellow like something up here, all the way to an orangish yellow like this. And it all depends on how they treat them. But compared to, you know, Daniel Smith's lemon yellow, I definitely feel like this one adds up or stacks up. 
Um, they're both very beautiful. This one I feel like is more vibrant, maybe. Um, they're of course two different pigments. This one just looks a little bit more bright in real life. Um, yeah, they just, they seem pretty similar. So I actually really like this color. And even in the uh, glaze that I did down there, I thought it may only be this, but in the light glazes, they look more cool and desaturated in both the Daniel Smith's Lemon Yellow as well as this one right here. Again, not the, not the same pigment, so not going to react exactly the same. Another thing I noticed, um, and I'm just going to go ahead and mention it on this first swatch, is that a lot of the colors don't have, like, whoosh flow. They do have flow when you add it add it to a wet piece of paper. They're gonna It's going to spread out. But it's not gonna be like Daniel Smith's where they whoosh out, or Coors where they whoosh out. Daniel Smith uses um, a lot of Oxgall in their paints, and then Coors uses Aquazol, which makes their um, their paints whoosh out. Um, so these act more like, say, Sennelier or Mission Gold or Schmincke, where they don't whoosh, they just kind of spread out slowly. So you have to give them time to spread out. But that gives you the chance to move them around the, the way you want them to. All right, so the next pigment that we have, I don't think I have another single pigment color of this to compare it to, um, but it is PY154. It's their permanent yellow, which is considered their mid-yellow in their 24 set. Um, and it's kind of equivalent to uh, the color Hansy Yellow Medium by Daniel Smith. It is the same pigment that um, Pure Yellow from uh, Schmincke is made out of. Um, and it stands up, again, to a lot of the colors in that range. Now, they're not, of course, the same pigment, so it does look a little bit differently. But even with, with less pigment, using less paint to make these swatches, it still is just as bright and vivid as the other colors. I hope you can see that. The only thing that did um, change a little bit is because I didn't add so much paint here, I didn't pull down as much paint, but you still get the ranges there. So like here you can see I pulled tons of paint down here to pull it out, but here because I was trying not to, you can tell. You can kind of tell the difference. Um, anywho. So also another disclaimer about these things. Because of the amount of paint, paint, because of the amount of paint I'm in, because of the amount of pain that I'm in, my hands are super shaky and I cannot paint. They actually seem very steady right now, I don't know why. Um, but I, I had the worst time trying to make these color charts and so I could not get a flat wash, like a perfect flat wash like this for the life of me. I had so much trouble. So some of these look kind of like a child did them. Some of them are okay. But it also happens in a lot of my other paints uh, as well where I couldn't get a complete flat wash because my hands were shaking or something was going on or I was doing them not in a place where I could have them dry in a flat wash or something like that. Um, but anyway, this is Permanent Gamboge by, I put T-A-W for Turner's, Turner Artist Watercolors. Um, and this is the three pigment color that comes in the 24 set. It's made with PY150, PY110, and PY109. So the first yellow we talked about, the isoendolene yellow, and then the synthetic isoendolene yellow, and mostly um, PY150, which is the uh, nickel azo yellow. And I don't have, this one has PY97 and PY110. This is Daniel Smith's uh, New Gamboge. And they're all different mixtures, but if you compare them to the colors that are similar, this is New Gamboge by Daniel Smith, and Permanent Gamboge by when, uh, Turner's, and then here's Winsor and Newton's Gamboge, you can see that uh, the Turner's is more or less desaturated than the Winsor and Newton's version. Um, I think Winsor and Newton's version is desaturated a little bit more because it's using a PR pigment, a red pigment, which does um, kind of desaturate the yellow part of it. Um, but here, even when compared to Daniel Smith, and again, using less paint, you can see that this color, I think, outshines Daniel Smith's new Gamboge. 
Um, it does have one extra pigment in there that I think it's probably not necessary. I think they could have gotten away with PY150 and just one isoandaline yellow. Um, but it's still, it's because of the PY150, it's very, very vibrant and looks, it just looks more vibrant than the Daniel Smith's New Gamboge, even Sennelier's. And then we're moving into kind of different territory over there. So I was definitely amazed whenever I saw this initially and was like, wow, you really don't need to use a ton of their pigments. And again, I'm going to show you that in a demonstration towards the end. Um, so now we have Permanent Scarlet, uh, PR188, and like I said, that's a naphthol pigment. Um, so it has a two star rating for uh, the, the Light Fast, and it again is... Uh, on its own, PR1, PR188 is transparent to semi-transparent. Um, and you can kind of see that here with the transparency, or hopefully you can see. And then if we say, compare it to some similar hues. So, um, do I have a similar hue? I don't have this pigment on its own. Like I said, they use a little bit different pigments than I'm used to, but this is um, kind of a more historical pigment. It's older and, um, yeah. So I don't have this pigment on its own. I think I have it in mixes somewhere, but that of course will not show the difference. But if you can see compared to like the other warm, uh, warm reds, it's still very bright and vivid and Again, I'm not. I didn't use as much pigment or color as I did in other other paints. So I, I'm quite enjoying the Turner watercolors. You just have to get used to using them. Um, and then here's Pyrol Red, and it is PR254, which I do have right here. Um, comparable to Windsor and Newton, for me, Windsor and Newton again looks a little bit. It looks stronger in pigment. Um, but it also looks a little bit desaturated. So it looks like it has, mm, I don't know how to explain this, but it just looks a little bit dirtier than this one does. This one looks just cleaner and, and more, more vibrant. If you can see that, I hope you can see those side by side. Um, but still very beautiful color. Um, I have Daniel Smith, uh, PR254 and I do not know where it is, but I do have this I where I put my um here's Pyrol Red here's Daniel Smith's and I think it stands up pretty well to Daniel Smith's PR254 although Daniel Smith still is a little bit different than um than Turner's Turner seems to be more of a bright color where in Windsor and Newton and Daniel Smith's version it seems to be more um I don't even know how to explain it a little bit more toned down than this one right here. This one seems a little bit more bright and vivid. All right, so then we have Rose Red, which is made with PV19, so that would be similar to um, Quinacridone Red, Rose, stuff like that. Let me find it real quick. All right, so here's my PV19s, and again, this right here is from me not being able to do a dang. You can see it here, too. I just had problems whenever I was doing the swatches, but I can tell. Um, and I just want to share that with you that their rose red matches up, you know, with other PV19s. And of course, when it comes to PV19, the chemical properties and the physical properties that they um, place on the pigments changes the colors a little bit. So it, it's all variable. They're, none of them are going to be exactly alike between each brand, um, but but the, it stands up to all the other artist grade colors right there with PB19. And that's generally a color that is going to be good in most brands. Very, very similar to M, uh, M Gold's PB19 version. All right, so the next one we have is Quinacridone Magenta. This is an extremely bright and purpley Quinacridone Magenta. It's made with PR122, um, which is one of my favorite Quinacridone Magenta colors. Um, but as you can see here, it is so bright. 
this um, from Coors, and Coors is one of my favorite. It actually looks dull compared to Turner's. Um, let's see, I think this is the only PR-122 I have by itself. But yeah, it's very, very beautiful. I actually really, really, really like this color, and it mixes so well. I'll show you that in just a few minutes. That's another pigment that's kind of hard to mess up. Um, the next color is Wine Red. I don't really have anything else to compare it to, um, but it is made with PV23, which is just um, Doxazine Violet, and then it has PR14, which is actually Permanent Bordeaux, um, which is a, a mono azo bluish red type pigment, and then it has the fluorescence in it. Um, so I think so this is super not light fast because of the fluorescence in it. But I think it's very similar to, like I said earlier, to Opera Rose to where the color doesn't actually go away. It doesn't disappear completely because these two pigments themselves have a light fast rating of two. So they're still gonna stay there for a while. But the fluorescence will go away really fast. So I think you'll get more of a bluish purple um, when this fades. Uh, but something to think about whenever, if you like this color, but you don't want to use it in artist grade paintings, um, because it will fade, it will change colors over time. I just don't know how much. Um, and I've actually never heard of PR14 as a Bordeaux color. I have PV23 as my Bordeaux color by Daniel Smith. Um, but that's what it says online. PR14 is Bordeaux, permanent Bordeaux. All right, so the next color is another color that's kind of hard to compare. This is um, Turner's Purple Gromwell. And it's made with four different pigments, which confuses me, but it is a very pretty color. Um, again, it's made with Dioxazine Violet, um, the Quinacridone Magenta that I just showed you. It has a purple in it, and then it has PV42, um, which is another violet. I think earlier I tried to write down PY42. Let me double check that actually. I don't want to lie. Yeah, PY42, that's right. I was right, I just didn't write it down right. All right, so PY42. And I think that color, the PY42 was added in to kind of tone this down a little bit. Um, I don't like the fact that it has so many pigments in it because I don't know how it's going to react whenever I'm swatching or mixing colors. I think it's one of those paints you're going to have to kind of use on its own or maybe like add colors in it that push this color aside. Possibly you'll have to learn to use this color. It's probably not a great mixing color, although I, we will test it in just a little bit. And again, I don't really have anything to compare it to. It's just kind of a new color. <laughs> Um, but it's still very, very vibrant and pretty, and again, without using so much color. The next one is Dioxazine Violet, which is comparable to every single one of these Dioxazine Violets. I think Coors gets a little bit darker, and so does Windsor & Newton's. Windsor & Newton is actually my preferred um, PV23 pigment to use, just because it is, so far, the, the most light fast one. Um, but yeah, this stands up to, to all of them. It's actually very, very vibrant compared to them. Their colors are all very, very vibrant. All right, so the next color we have is Indian Green Blue, which is PG60, um, which is what M. Graham has for their anthraquinone blue, or anthraquinoid, I can't remember. Um, but it's the same pigment, the same light fast, and the same transparency. The only thing is, because I try not to increase the um, the amount of pigment used, this one seems a lot lighter than M. Gra <clears throat> excuse me, M. Grams. I am losing my voice. But when compared, you know, to where I poured out the pigment quite a bit, it's very, very dark up here. Um, but I actually really, really like this version um, because it's. I don't know. I think I like both versions. They're both really, really great. Um, the thing with this one is, is I can control how much intensity I get with it. Um, so it's all, 
it's all relative and all up to what you prefer in your paints. But I do still like this color, even though it's not exactly as saturated as the anthraquinone blue. And you can tell there is a big difference there. But I don't have other Indenthrene blues to compare it to. And even though it is still PG, PB60, they could have processed it a little bit differently physically and chemically and got a lighter version of it or a different, different hue of it. So that's something to think about when you're comparing watercolors is that, you know, they're not always going to be the same. It, it's all dependent on their processing and um, their chemical and physical processing and how they treat the pigments and fillers or binders and stuff like that. So everything's a little bit different. Um, this is their ultramarine. I will say that I'm not a fan of their ultramarine, although it does stand up color wise to a lot of the other pigments. Um, it's still not as purpley, not as warm as the other pigments. It's more um, leaning towards green, I think. Um, if you can see compared to the other ones. Now I'm almost positive if I would have made these this more intense, like I did right here on this color chart, then it's still is just as intense as the other colors. Um, but like I said, I did dilute these a little bit just to see if they were super pigmented compared to the other colors. Um, I do still like the hue of the color, but I noticed there's not a lot of granulation in their ultramarine, which some people may absolutely love, but I'm a big fan of granulation. These two right here, and this one right here, even though it has a second pigment in it, the granulation in those three colors are, it's amazing. So I absolutely love, especially Daniel Smith's French Ultramarine for granulation. And then M. Graham is a very close second. All right, so the next one is Thalo Blue, which of course I have a ton of. And again, with Thalo Blue, I feel like I probably could have used more intense pigments. Um, see so you can see right here even compared to my little swatch right there that if I would have used it in intense mass tones it would have been darker more dark like this um, but instead it's a little bit lighter so it matches Sennelier's and is very transparent just like Sennelier um, so I really really like these I find them very comparable in transparency and just pure saturation they seem to be a lot like Sennelier in that. Um, but like I said, I didn't add intense swatches like this to get the highest mass tone there like I did in other colors. Um, but it's still, it's a very beautiful phthalo blue. And it wouldn't be hard to get more pigment to mix deep, deep blues if that's what you wanted to do. But it is a little bit different. But then here again is Daniel Smith's phthalo blue. And when compared to that, this one seems a lot brighter. So that's just something to think about. And it also is PB15, so it's a little bit different. Um, they didn't put the colon by it, so I'm not sure if it's a PB15-3, a PB15-6, a PB15 what. Um, I'm guessing closer to a PB15-3. Um, very, very close to Daniel Smith and more saturated, more clean looking than Daniel Smith's version. So the next color is Cerulean Blue, which I don't actually have a color exactly like that. Um, but Cerulean Blue is um, made with PB36 in their brand. So that's actually Cobalt, Chromi Cobalt Chromite green spinel. Um, it's not the real cerulean blue pigment. It's actually a hue, um, but it is uh, what Daniel Smith and Windsor and Newton calls cerulean blue chromium. And I actually really like this color. It's very similar to Cenarius blue um, and like the phthalo blues, except for it's very granulating, which I love. I have not tried cerulean blue ever. I really don't know why. Um, but I really, really do like it. I feel like it would make a, a great color for sky colors. And it does have a little bit of opacity, but you can see it's not like 
overpowering opacity. It's probably the same as um, Cenarius Blue when it comes to opacity. All right, so the next color is Turquoise Blue. So this is a whole different ball game here. Here's M. Graham's Cobalt Teal, which is also made with PB28, but um, Turner's is just a little bit more on the blue side. And again, this pigment varies. You can add magnesium to it and other different things to it to get it to change properties, which we'll see in a minute is a more green pigment. Um, PG50 is a cobalt titanite green. So Daniel Smith's cobalt teal is actually uh, more of a green hue. And as you can see, this one is even greener. Next color that I have is cobalt turquoise. Um, and again, it's very different from the other ones. I think the closest it comes to is, honestly, none. <laughs> It's a very weird mixture. It mixes the um, the PG50 with the PG36, so you kind of get a really awesome cobalt turquoise color that I don't have a comparison for. Let's see um, in the back if I have cobalt turquoise by Daniel Smith. Cobalt turquoise. So here's the original cerulean blue, and you can see it's PB35. Here is the PB36 next to that. Very different. And then here is Cerulean Blue Chromium. And uh, you can tell it's a little bit different than this one right here, but Turner's is even more intense than, than Daniel Smith's. Although I do like this one, it's more toned down. And I feel like that would help me a little bit more than than this one because I already have the phthalo blue, but I can always water it down to get it similar to this. So again, another thing to think about and something I'm going to demonstrate more in the future. Um, but the cobalt turquoise, let me find that one. Ultramarine cobalt turquoise. Cobalt turquoise, theirs is much more green. This one is definitely more turquoisey instead of green. Um, I don't really have too much to compare it to. Hmm. Anyway, it's a beautiful color, so I like that. It's another cobalt type pigment that I don't have. Because they can treat them in so many different ways, the, the colors for cobalt teal or cobalt turquoise or anything like that, it tends to create variables when it comes to those colors. All right, so then we have Maya Blue. I have not swatched my Mayan Blue yet, I don't think. I may have to put it back here. All right, so here is Mayan Blue Genuine, which is very different than Maya Blue. Now this is PB82. Um, which is the normal pigment for Maya Blue. Um, but I don't really have much to go with so far in swatches. This one's much lighter than the Maya Blue Genuine. It may be similar to Maya Dark Blue. Let's see. Here's Maya Blue Genuine again. Um, and then, let's see. Maya Blue... Mine dark blue. Nope, see, very different from those colors, but I still really enjoy this color in and of itself. Very pretty color. I honestly don't have anything to compare it to, but personally, I like this color as it is. Um, but like I said, I don't have much to compare it to. All right, so the next color that we have to show is phthalo green. And again, like I say repeatedly, I try not to use so much pigment. Again, I will show you it on here. Very, very deep and intense with tons and tons of pigment. Um, but even with just a slight amount of pigment, it's very comparable to the other greens. And uh, it's actually a little bit more on the green side than it is the blue side. Um, even though it is PG7, which is Thalo Green Blue Shade, it does have a slight tendency to a more warm type green than a cooler green like these right here. Um, but it still um, is usable for 
mixing phthalo greens with other colors. Um, it just will mix just a little bit differently. So it's something that you have to use to get used to. And of course, when it's super intense and you need that deep, deep hue, you can get that. Um, it's just a little bit more pigment there. Um, and then we have Hooker's Green, which I don't know if I have a Hooker's Green because I try not to buy um, unless they just come in sets. Don't try to pre get pre-mixed greens or if they're just colors that I just can't go without, like daily yellow green, love that, and green gold. Um, let's see. This is PG36 and PY110, which is isoendoline yellow and thalo green. Uh, trying to think. Thalo green uh, yellow shade. And actually, let's see. Compared to that, it does, the thalo green blue shade does look a little bit more on the blue shade. Just showing you comparison to the PG36, which is the um, thalo green yellow shade. Uh, this right here is made from M Gold, Mission Gold, which is sap green um, with exactly the same pigments. And here's their sap green as well, which is made with the exact same pigments. Very, very similar color there. Um, very intense, very beautiful sap green. I still when I mix my greens, I still use quinacridone gold, the original quinacridone gold hue with um, with thalo green to get my sap green, and I, I really enjoy that one, so I I don't know. I'm not a fan of premixed green, but for those of you who are, I don't have a lot to compare to, but this is a very pretty, um, pretty green. Here's a hooker's green for M gold. Um, made with a little bit more stuff in there. It's got a brown in it to kind of tone it down. So it's a little bit more, oh, this is sap green, sorry. <laughs> Hooker's green, very, very different. Oh my goodness. See, these two are made with exactly the same pigments and I don't have a Hooker's green to compare to other than um, Mission Gold, which is made with completely different pigments. Um, and then here's sap green again, compared to Windsor and Newton, um, made with the same exact pigment. This one again still has, um, because I usually try to make the mask tone really, really strong, um, you can tell that it's a little bit different there. This one's a little bit more brighter and again, more, more saturated, I think, more intense with color and vibrancy than Winsor & Newton's version. All right, I think that's enough for Hooker's Green and Sap Green. I'm not really a professional when it comes to comparing greens. I usually just mix mine, but I do like this color uh, for the sap green. Hooker's green, I absolutely do not like at all. It looks like a puke green that I wouldn't ever use. Um, something that I would probably mix. Um, like I have another green that I don't like. I think it is. Mm. I have no idea where it is. Um, anyway, there, I have another green that's very similar to this. Uh, it's M. Graham, Permanent Green Light. Not the same pigments at all, but I absolutely hate this green. I have no idea why. It's just not the green that I would prefer to use. Um, so yeah, I'm not, not a professional when it comes to greens, so sorry. I can show you how to mix greens, but comparing greens is not really my thing. So I'm kind of going to skip on that one a little bit. Um, and then we have the olive green, which is very, very pretty color. It's very, very toned down. So if you want a very earthy olive green, this is a good choice. I, I don't have anything like it. I do have a sap green from Core. It's very similar to that. Um, sap green's Core is very earthy, and it is made with very similar pigments. Uh, PR101, and it uses PG36, but um, this one uses PG7 and then isoendoline yellow. But it's very similar to coarse sap green. Um, very different from Mission Gold's olive green. And I think I have one more olive green from Sennelier, I thought. Maybe not. Anyway, this is a very pretty color and I actually really like this mixture so I probably will use this mixture um, just as a convenience color later for whenever I'm trying to make leaves and stuff because it's already pre-made and I actually really like this one. 